As Aristotle famously puts it, quote, the soul is the first actualization of a natural body that has life potentially, end quote. Souls in the hylomorphic tradition, following on this announcement, are principles of living bodies or organisms. Whatever the transcendent possibilities of certain types of souls, in particular human souls, as opposed to the souls of non-animals or non-human animals or plants, uh, to have a soul is to be disposed toward a certain path of biological development. In other words, having a soul is being embodied in some possibly very broad sense. I have been asked to discuss the prospects of artificial intelligence as it relates to the human soul. I'm going to suggest that the prospects for artificial intelligence are rather dim in light of what it means to have a human soul. I am not, however, going to argue for that conclusion from premises regarding the transcendent or immaterial possibilities of human beings. Rather, the more interesting and existentially important source of skepticism regarding artificial intelligence stems from our understanding of the embodied nature of the human soul. Note that in what follows, I will not consider whether artificial intelligence is a real possibility. Indeed, I think a fair case can be made that in some sense of intelligence, AI is not only a possibility, but probably even an actuality. Rather, my concern with, will be with whether artificial intelligence is equivalent to our intelligence. In what follows, I will argue that any artificial intelligence is likely not what we do when we think, because our thinking is embodied in ways it is difficult to take seriously as possibilities for machines. Whatever else machines might do, they are not among us because our soul is a form of life. Okay. Wittgenstein argues that understanding a concept or using a word correctly is enabled, quote, by nature and by a particular training, a particular education, end quote. And our ability to say anything true at, at all is always limited by the fact, uh, by that form of life which we find ourselves in. Our given nature is partially constitutive of the form of life that, en that enables and limits our giving and taking reasons and subsequent revisions to our normative commitments. These capacities, quote, are as much a part of our natural history as walking, eating, drinking, playing, end quote. In other words, as Alistair McIntyre puts it, our rational form of life is only possible for beings who are biologically constituted as we are. Of course, a particular training and education, that is a culture, play an equally important role in our initiation into our distinctively human capacities. We cannot read off mind from nature, and we do not become rational just by showing up as human organisms, or at least we don't we don't learn to exercise the capacity, but through a training. Nevertheless, because our form of life is a way of being a certain kind of animal, the development of our rationality, according to McIntyre, quote, has its starting point in our initial animal condition, end quote. Our form of life is both nature and second nature, biological and a cultural inheritance, which must be cultivated in us late arrivals on the conceptual scene through an education that is operative within those limitations, which I will refer to broadly as embodiment. The crucial step in the space of reasons is language acquisition, but we do not begin uh, youngsters on that journey by teaching them formal logic. Rather, we mostly learn to speak at our mother's knee, as it were, through a caring relationship. Charles Taylor summarizes the upshot of the psychological findings regarding the relationship between emotional attachment and language acquisitions as follows. So this is quoting Taylor. The first and obvious fact is that children can only become speakers by being taught a language. That is, they have to pick up language from a community or a family, which is taking care of them. It's members talking to each other and talking to them. Without this human capacity for language, uh, excuse me, without this, the human capacity for language remains without effect. The children can't speak, as we see occasionally with feral children, uh, who have been brought up by animals. And moreover, they lack all capacities, which go along with language, end quote. Peter Hobson, a psychologist working on autism, makes much the same assessment. This is quoting Hobson. If a child fails to experience interpersonal engagement, the elaborate circuitry of the brain proves to be about as useful as a computer hardware working with inadequate software. The computer can still do fancy things of a rather humdrum kind, but it cannot support creative symbolic thinking, end quote. We begin our march towards reasoning by first becoming attached to other people. 
by building relations of shared emotional bonding with our caregivers. As Taylor continues, a, a confident emotional bond allows an intense sharing of intentions between the, the bonded pair, such as the meaning of a word, the content of a concept can become an object for us. And only under such conditions does a child realize her linguistic capacity. Although once it is mastered, innovation becomes possible. That is, we can take responsibility for our normative commitments. It is within a milieu of shared empathy that our natural potency for rationality first comes to actuality. And it is never fully independent of that emotional foundation. As McIntyre again puts it, only through a responsive sympathy and empathy with our fellows are we able to impute those others the kind of reasons for their actions that, by making their actions intelligible to us, enable us to respond to them in ways that they too can find intelligible, end quote, which is the prerequisite for distinctively human cognitive capacity, or at least their exercise. Evolutionary psychologist Matt Rossano summarizes the scientific case along these lines to, to the effect that distinctive human mindedness always presupposes a shared intentionality constituted by a uniquely human capacity for sharing emotional, cognitive, and attentional states and coordinating actions relevant to those states. That is, at least in its origins, we cannot neatly separate our uniquely human cognitive capacities from the emotional and biological relationships on which we depend in our early tutelage. It is our innate ability to share ourselves emotionally in, in the particularities of a communal life that makes possible our shared materially significant conceptuality, which is to say, though potent with the possibility for transcendent self-critical reflection, our mindedness is embodied. Not only attachment, but trust plays a very large role in the development of distinctively human capacities. Cognitive scientists and psychologists use the phrase theory of mind to refer to the default assumption that other human beings are rational. And this structure seems to be in the background of our interactions, even at very early stages of psychological development. What, it, what this amounts to particularly is that human beings are actually natural imitators and conformists and not radically individualist rebels. We assume that there is something sensible at work in the behaviors of others, especially our elders. And therefore, we tend to mimic what they do, even when their reasons for doing so are not completely transparent to us. This tendency to interpret and to imitate the behavior of trusted others charitably is a crucial element in what makes the what, pardon me, in what makes the complicated education necessary for cultural transmission possible. We are such great learners because we trust teachers and mimic their behavior, even when we do not quite get what they're up to. As psychologist William von Hippel puts it, theory of mind uh, is an evolutionary boon. If I understand that another person has knowledge that I don't have, then I understand that this person might impart knowledge on me. This understanding prompts me to pay close attention to potential teachers and to imitate their actions, even if I don't discern their purpose. Compared to psychologist Michael Tomasello, argues that distinctively human linguistic thinking could not have come about without a number of earlier adaptations for joint intentionality, joint goals, common conceptual ground, recursive uh, inferences, and that its eventual emergence was part of a larger process in which human activities were conventionalized and normativized. In other words, human thinking presupposes an evolutionary background that rewards cooperation and trust. Thinking is something we do together. Moreover, this dependence on a background of social cooperation is not only necessary for the species development of rationality, but likewise for the initiation of each individual into the practice of thinking. Since our, our thinking requires us to cooperate within, as Thomas Stella puts it, flexible behavioral organization, cognition, and decision-making, which themselves require time to master a local group's cultural artifacts, symbols, and practices, human rationality requires an extended ontogeny in which the child and her developing brain are, are in constant interaction with the environment, especially the social environment. In other words, because of the particularities of distinctive human socially oriented cognition, we are dependent on a protracted childhood, even compared to other sophisticated cognizers among higher apes. Whatever our transcendent possibilities, our minds emerge either in the species or the individual, in a context of emotional attachment, social trust, and nurturing. It is far from clear that we are ever free from this grounding in emotional attachment and trust when exercising our cognitive capacities. For example, 
even after our cognitive powers are up and running. They seem to be sensitive to whether they are imbo- embedded in empathetic contexts of joint uh, intentionality. There is then some evidence that our cognition is always tied to social uh, empathetic engagement, or at the very least that our cognitive powers are most effectively exercised in such contexts. It is difficult to envision what would count for shared intentionality without some sort of emotional or empathetic grounding. Communication without empathy is not shared cognition of an objective world, but parallel processing of internal states. That is, our ability to achieve an objective stance is the product of our shared task of checking ourselves in common practice of reasons giving that we take up with our fellows. Thus, human mindedness likely is always dependent on an emotional context to some greater or lesser extent, at least for its optimal function. Hume was no doubt wrong when he claimed that reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. But the ability to assess and control our response to our emotions does not mean that we are capable of articulating conceptual content utterly free from an emotional coloring. As we have discussed in the directly foregoing, there is good reason to conclude the proper function of our cognitive powers is likely inextricably bound to emotional ties or at least empathetic deference to our colleagues in the, in the practice of thinking. I, however, want to go further to claim that our conceptual contents, not just our cognition of those contents, are likewise entangled with our emotions. I learned how to use the concept of Paris by watching war films with my father, attending lectures by teachers whom I admired, hearing anecdotes from cherished and well-traveled friends, reading literature that moved me spiritually. To separate the notion of Paris from the emotional milieu is to render the concept meaningless, no less than separate it from the history of the West would empty it of significant content. There are material entailments of the concept of Paris that are partially determined by the emotional significance it has for someone using it to make a judgment. For example, your fond memories of your honeymoon in the city of, of lights will rightly guide some of your subsequent judgments about Paris. The emotional bond with other people with whom I share uh, concerns plays an irreplaceable role in initially fixing the content of the concept for me, and it is likely that the concept is forever colored by those attachments. A rat and I might both be in similar neurophysiological states after eating a sugar cookie, and the resulting hormonal release might play similar roles in the reward structures that explain some of our behavioral dispositions. But there is a content to the concept of cookie as I use it and without which I would be unable to use it as I do now, that cannot be separated from the emotionally and culturally rich memories of Christmas and the like. The emotional entanglements and how I interpret them are part of what cookie means to me, which partly fixes the conceptual content, especially in its material implications. It is an empathy that binds us to our fellow thinkers in care and concern for the objects about which we speak and think. And without that emotional embodiment, fully functioning human thought can gain uh, fully functioning human thought, thought cannot gain traction in a real world. Maurice Merleau-Ponty articulates all of these points well in terms of embodiment, quoting Mon- uh, Merleau-Ponty. Vision is already inhabited by a sense that gives it a function in the spectacle of the world and in our existence. The pure quale would only be given to us if the world were a spectacle and one's body a mechanism with which an impartial mind could become acquainted. Sense, however, invests the quality with a living value, grasps it first in its signification for us, for the weighty mass that is our body. And as a result, sense always includes reference to the body, end quote. Notice here that Merleau-Ponty does not mean by body merely the sum total of one's physiological parts. Embodiment for Merleau-Ponty certainly includes as much, but he has a wider view of the body as our, our being embedded in a body schema, as he puts it. On this accounting, the body is, quote, a general system of symbols for the world and through which we, we can frequent this world, understand it, and find a signification for it, end quote. We are embodied not merely by virtue of the fact that our perception presupposes a certain neurophysiology, but more significantly, because the supposed simplest or most basic cases of qualitative awareness presuppose a background of emotional, practical, and historical embedding. Following Merleau-Ponty, we can see that even our most basic experiences and cognitions are tied to biological, emotional, social, and historical presuppositions, what I'm calling embodiment. 
for me, what it is like, as they say, the, the what is it like of an experience of, of a scarlet cube cannot be completely separated from its invocation of the scarlet letter and all the experiences tied to my reading of that novel as a high school student. In other words, qualitative experience, cultural involvement, personal attachment, and the intentionality of thought cannot be untangled, nor should we finally attempt to do so. All three of these aspects of human thought come online together. Thinking is always thinking about something, but that latter is always embedded in a world of meaning, attachment, and commitment. This claim is not an appeal to qualitative experiential atoms as enclosed in the internal irreducible consciousness of a mind. Whatever we might may have to say about all of that, our thinking always has a deep emotional framing. The divide between the emotional and the rational is not as neat as we often tend to expect. Our mindedness is always embedded in a non-cognitive context from which it draws lifeblood. As Evan Thompson puts it, quote, the subject uh, has to be seen as having a life in all its rich senses of this word as formed by its in individual history, as a living bodily subject of experience, and as belonging to an intersubjective life world, end quote. It is not only our emotional attachments and existential concerns that serve as the implicit non-conceptual undergirding of our explicit logical canons. What Herbert Dreyfus and Charles Taylor, excuse me, uh, what Herbert Dreyfus and Charles Taylor call our background grasp of things, meaningful concepts, must ground material inferences, and therefore they originate in and are subject to continual certification by the material world, stretching beyond our conceptualizations. Putting our concepts up against or deriving them from the world always presupposes a background of practical ability for dealing with an already existing world of things, an equipmental environment, as it's sometimes called. This notion of a practical background of coping skills necessary for the narrowly cognitive act is what Mer Merleau-Ponty has in mind when he claims that consciousness is not originarily an I think, but rather an I can. In other words, our knowing that always presupposes some knowing how with respect to the precognitive world of significance we occupy in virtue of our embodiment. Embedding in a set of nitty gritty skills for getting things done in a world of practical involvements gives our thinking bona fide material content. Again, with Merleau-Ponty, if embodiment is to provide us with a framing for materially significant perception, then my body is polarized by its tasks insofar as it exists towards them, insofar as it coils up, it, it coils up upon itself in order to reach its goal, and the body schema is, in the end, a manner of expressing that my body is in and towards the world." End quote. Embodiment supports semantically significant thoughts because it entails our mastery of practical significant acts. Dreyfus and Taylor motivate this point with the example of asking a youngster, say Cormac, to determine whether the picture in the next room is hung properly. Notice that we would only ask Cormac to take up this task on the assumption that he is, has, has a great many epistemic skills. He needs to know how to gain proper perspective on the picture standing neither too close nor too far. He must be able to judge the orientation of the edges of the picture against the lines in the ceiling and the walls. He needs to know how to find the room. He might need to know how to use other devices, such as doorknobs, locks, a level. And he needs to know better than to barge in if there is an important closed door meeting going on when he arrives, et cetera, et cetera. That is, if you should want to challenge him on his conclusion that the uh, about the orientation of the picture, you are in part asking him to make explicit all this rich, both social and technical know-how, which normally lies in our unnoticed background. Each act of knowing that presupposes myriad exercises of this know-how because, con because concepts only gain material content in transactions with a world that reveals itself to us through skillful, practical maneuvering. The most theoretically spectacular scientific claims presuppose the hands-on practicality of experimental design and execution if they're to have material significance. Even abstract acts of mathematics and pure logic fall back on tangible skills of writing and speaking when one is asked to make his reasons explicit. Show your work, Cormac, or you won't get full credit for the problem. Moreover, it is not just our semi-formalized procedures for verification that presupposes background practical coping with the world. Even basic perceptions do so. 
Dreyfus makes this point, drawing again on Merleau-Ponty and the Gestalt, Gestalt psychologists and Piaget. Quote, before we acquire appropriate skill, we experience only confused sensations. It is easiest to become aware of the body's role in taste and touch, but seeing too is a skill that has to be learned. Focusing, getting the right perspective, picking out details, all involve coordinated actions and anticipations, end quote. In other words, the things we see are really there, but we have to learn how to see them there. This know-how is an acquired bodily skill that we can only obtain through training among our senior peers in our form of life. Evan Thompson makes much the same point based not only on the phenomenological data, but also the fruits of the dynamic sensory-motor approach to perception adopted by many contemporary neuroscientists and psychologists, quoting Thompson. Per perpetual experience, excuse me, perceptual experience is not an inner event or state of the brain, but a skillful activity constituted by part of the perceiver's implicit practical knowledge of the way sensory stimulation varies with movement. And what it is to experience the world perceptually is to exercise one's bodily mastery or know-how of certain uh, patterns of sensory or motor dependence between one's sensing and moving body and the environment, end quote. All of that is to say that our very ability to perceive the world presupposes that we are already in that world. Being in, in this sense, is a skillful relationship that necessarily involves bodily engagement. In order to perceive the world, we must be able to work with it such that it can show itself to us. None of this is to say the content of our concepts cannot outstrip the practical undergirding. We can talk about more than we can do, but our talk is always grounded in our transactions with the world itself. Uh, as Merleau-Ponty puts it, quote, there is a privileged place for reason, but precisely in order to understand it, we must begin by placing back, uh, placing thought back among the phenomena of expression, end quote. That remark, I take it, is a concise statement of what it means to be embodied in a particularly human sense of embodiment, an embedding in culture, language, history, attachment, and biology that sets the conditions for transcendent rationality. With all that in mind, I want to argue that whatever might be said about a machine's achievement of transcendent rationality, AI, is not the same as our rationality, because it is not embodied in this manner. I will make this case by considering the role of pragmatic relevance, care, or what's sometimes called giving a damn, and, authentic, and authenticity play in the grounding of distinctively human cognition in light of our foregoing discussion of embodiment. All right, so pragmatic relevance. Consider yourself driving your car down the road. How many objects in your environment are you aware of when doing so? We know that in some sense of aware, you are conscious of far more than what is a current before the mind's eye, as it were. You aren't explicitly conscious of the trees you pass, the leaves blowing in the gutters, the address numbers uh, on the houses, the children playing on the lawns, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that all of that information is taken in by your nervous system in some sense. Very few of these data arise to the level of explicit awareness, though they are ready to hand in the background. As soon as one of those kids steps off the curb, hopefully that awareness will become explicitly present in your consciousness on the quick. The point is that consciousness of your environment is sorted in terms of relevance to the task at hand. We are confronted with a vast myriad of phenomena, and we are able to have an intelligible experience by sorting out what is relevant and uh, to what we are trying to do at the moment. As Dreyfus puts it, most of what we experience must remain in the background so that something can be perceived as in the foreground. Do not let how complicated an ability that is pass by too quickly. How many pieces of currently irrelevant but potentially relevant bits of information are being tracked by your nervous system right now? Notice how easily your consciousness can move uh, from one frame of relevance to another, smoothly transitioning from the lane change you are making uh, to the insipid commercial on the radio. It is easy to miss how complicated this task is, uh, just as it is easily easy to fail to appreciate the fluidity with which you make these transitions ubiquitously. How many different frames of relevance can you transfer to and from? Dreyfus makes this point very well in the following detail. It has to do with the way man is at home in his world, has it comfortably wrapped around him, so to speak. 
human beings are somehow already situated in such a way that what they need in order to cope with things is distributed among them where they need it. The system of relations, which makes it possible to discover objects when they are needed, is our home and or our world. The human world is pre-structured in terms of human purposes and concerns in such a way that what counts as an object or, or is significant about an object is a function of or embodies that concern. This cannot be matched by a computer, which can deal only with universally defined, that is, context-free objects. In trying to si simulate this field of concern, the programmer can only assign to the already determinate facts further determinate facts called values, which only complicates the retrieval problem for the machine, end quote. Dreyfus's point, following Heidegger, is that human experience and subsequent practice is always, always pre-sorted, as it were, by pragmatic concerns ultimately grounded in basic human needs. Our thinking is presented with indefinitely, even infinitely, many possible semantic engagements with the world. But we winnow these dizzying possibilities down based on a sort of pragmatic sorting. Moreover, we move among these various pragmatic sortings with utter facility in a way it seems highly unlikely that any sort of algorithm can possibly capture, because they are always based on our particularly bodily and culturally conditioned prior attempts to deal with the world. Again, as Dreyfus puts it, our present concerns and past know-how always already determines what will be ignored and what will remain on the outer horizon of experience as possibly relevant and what will be immediately taken into account as essential. Notice that this phenomenon is most profoundly reflected in our linguistic practices. The number of true utterances in any given situation that can be made with even a truncated English vocabulary boggles the mind. Take the mere, uh, merely the vocabulary of the average fifth grader and how all humans uh, how all the humans who have ever existed, uh, if they were to do nothing but form sentences from the resource from those resources for the entire history of the world, would not have exhausted those resources. Their utterances over all those centuries would would not have exhausted what we can say, what can be said even with this basic vocabulary. In fact, you have probably never said the exact same sentence twice, excepting circumstances of explicit self quotation or recitation. Thus. Almost everything we say is a novel utterance, and yet relevant to the varied and overlapping contexts which constitute our world. Moreover, this infinite plasticity leaves us with vast options for what can be said with semantic value at any given moment. Whenever you enter a room, how many true statements could you make? There are no doubt thousands of utterances that could be made, but among the multitude of true statements regarding your implicit environment, uh, how many are you even tempted to utter? A minuscule fraction, indeed. Unless we have some way of narrowing all the possibilities of what could be said, nothing could meaningfully be uttered at all. Notice, however, that you likewise change relevance frames effortlessly in a single coherent conversation. We can move effortlessly in and out of the relevance frames in which Smitty's shirt is stained, the, the interview is in an hour, and the atomic weight of chlorine is 35.453, and they can all make sense in, in an overall conversation. We can both stay on topic and change topic with equal facility, which implies the background sorting of likely millions of linguistic possibilities. Here then is the point. What would it take to specify a set of rules that captures the plasticity of relevance sorting implicit in any human conversation? How many such rules would have to be specified? How would appropriate transitions from one frame of relevance to another be specified? Our situation, the world in which we meaningfully and pragmatically engage is, as Dreyfus puts it, organized from the start in terms of human needs and propensities which give the facts meaning, make the facts what they are, so that there is never a question of storing and sorting uh, through a list of meaningless isolated data like what we, we would envision a computer doing. The problem is not just qualitative, uh, uh, through the, pardon me, the pause, problem is not just quantitative, though the sheer number of algorithms to be specified is daunting. The problem is also qualitative. All of these frames of relevance seem open-ended. Uh, they, they, there really is no hard line between what is relevant to a conversation about chameleons and a conversation about the Battle of Austerlitz. I bet we could. There, there is a coherent set of conversational movements that would get us from one to the other while making perfectly good sense. 
how will a syntax for such an open-ended process be specified? The notion that this will soon be done, this will be done someday strains credulity. That is not to say it is impossible. And indeed, there are very smart people spending their lives work on solving these kinds of problems, but the odds seem to favor skepticism at this point. Our human linguistic competence always operates in a practical holism, as we'll call it. The truth of an utterance is insufficient for it to make reasonable sense. It is not enough that it be a statement of truth uh, as, as, as it must also be appropriate, right? It must be an appropriate statement of truth. A mark of rationality is therefore not only truth-telling, but appropriate truth-telling. That is, a single utterance is meaningful only in light of what has been said and what could be said next. Meaning doesn't only float up from the individual utterances to the conversational whole, but it also sinks down from the conversational holes to the sentential parts. In other words, human intelligence always human human intelligence is always part of an overall meaningful frame of reference. And in any given situation, there is an indefinite number of holes within which one might operate. That conversational hole is defined, albeit without hard edges, pragmatically. Utterances are relevant to what we are doing in our conversation, which is connected with, to both human needs and our prior contingent development of skills and know-how. We communicate meaningfully in a conversation only because we are operating under an implicit yet open-ended agreement about what we are trying to achieve by speaking to each other, and we are skilled craftsmen in our linguistic tasks. Capturing the, that conceptual, excuse me, that, that contextual plasticity and contingency of the pragmatics and linguistic competence is a, is a major difficulty for AI, not a deal breaker, but a big problem. Maybe intelligent machines can be constructed, but they will not be rational in our way unless they are able to sort the uh, sort the narrow and narrow the possibilities, these semantic possibilities, according to needs and pragmatic contingency. Moreover, even if the, the programming difficulty posed by open-ended sortings for pragmatic relevance could be overcome, and maybe it will, our ways of sorting are based on biological needs that have been conditioned by our natural history. Is a system, even if it sorts the world with the same results, really doing the same thing as we are if it does so without a significant connection to our evolutionary past? I doubt that we can separate the semantic content of our thinking from our natural history entirely. Non-living, non-involved beings are not thinking how we think, and they are not thinking what we think because our thought is always in the service of an inherited concern over our well-being and mortality that we share with all living things. The same issue arises regarding our cultural history. Can we separate the semantic content of our thoughts from the cultural content in which they come to be? Thus, even if a machine could be engineered to operate with complete facility and skill, the same range of pragmatic sortings of the semantic context as we do, it is far from clear that such a machine would be thinking. At the very least, it would not necessarily be thinking as we think. Okay, giving a damn. John Hoglund, famously claims, quote, the trouble with artificial intelligence is that machines just don't give a damn, end quote. Here's how he explains the quip. A single speech act cannot be embarrassing, shameful, irresponsible, or foolish in isolation, but only as an event in a biography of a whole, historical individual, a person who, who, whose personality it reflects and whose self-understanding it threatens, only a being that cares about who it is as some sort of enduring whole can care about guilt, folly, self-respect, achievement, life, or death. And only such a being can read. This holism now, not even apparently in the text, but manifestly in the reader, I call existential holism. It is essential, I submit, to understanding the meaning of any text that in familiar sense has any real meaning, end quote. Hoglund's point is that pragmatically defined frames of reference from which individual utterances derive significance from meaningful wholes is to a very large extent itself determined by what we really care about. Because I am concerned about my honor, I am undertaking some dangerous feat, which leads me to be concerned uh, with some narrow set of subsets in my environment. You can make sense of my talk about these entities only to deg the degree that you likewise share a commitment to this project, or at least you can empathize with it. I make sense to you because you get what I'm up to pragmatically, but that only makes sense if you have some grasp of what I care about. My fear of death draws my attention to certain dark possibilities for the next decade, which might not otherwise invade my concerns. 
this fear attunes me to constituents of the world that were previously outside my kin, and yet they are disclosed by my mood as being there all along. My love for my wife diverts my consciousness from occurrences that might have otherwise aroused my ire or brings my mind to other welcomed occurrences that might have escaped notice of, of the eye of just about anyone else. All these moods narrow the possibilities of experience and thereby bring to the foreground certain entities among the plurality that could be the objects of our experience, only because they are ordered to things about which one has a deep care or concern. It is our existential concerns that set out our practical agendas, which in turn constitute our world for us. Allow me to play on a superficial linguistic similarity among sign, signify, and significance to make Hoglund's, really Heidegger's point. A sign can only signify, signify, something inasmuch as it is illuminated by a world of significance, significance. It is only because I care about myself, the kind of person I wish to be, I care about other people, or I care that certain things occur in the world, that I take up a pragmatic stance that allows me, my speech, to make intelligible sense. Or at least that is one way we do the sorting, and maybe the most important uh, way for us, and maybe the most distinctive too. Pragmatic stances, or what we will call linguistic practices, are what allow us to determine meaningful utterances non-arbitrarily, and our existential care is what makes our determination of linguistic practices non-arbitrary. Is our concern for who and what we are, our care for other people, and what we value in the world, that finally determines what our signs signify. Among all the possibilities, it is the significance of what we give a damn about that primarily sorts the world, uh, that primarily sorts the relevant from the irrelevant. There may be other ways of sorting the relevant from the irrelevant, but the human way of sorting only follows from the fact that our own being and the being of what we love is an issue for us. To fail to care about what you are saying is a failure to mean anything at all. The logical space of reasons in which we operate is defined by our care for our meaning, not just our utterances, but our lives. In fact, living in the context of what makes our lives meaningful is a necessary condition for our making meaningful, non-arbitrary utterances. This is what Wittgenstein mostly meant when he famously claimed that our words have meaning only in a stream of life. As Hogland puts it, quote, apart from a few restricted domains, like playing chess, analyzing mass spectra, or making airline reservations, the most ordinary conversations are fraught with life and all its meanings, which is to say love is the mark of the human, end quote. Maybe the algorithm behind Expedia can, can outperform us in winnowing the options for a flight to LAX, but can any algorithm be produced that would sort the world in terms of the existential concerns that motivate the trip? Even a machine, even if a machine could, would it be doing what I am doing? Would it care about it? It is hard to articulate even what an affirmative answer to that question might take. And once again, it is in the, the embodiment that, that we spoke of above that marks the difference between bona fide, human rationality, and AI. All right, finally, authenticity. A kind of structure of meaning has arisen for us as our discussion has unfolded. Individual utterances are meaningful inasmuch as they participate in pragmatically defined linguistic practices. But these linguistic practices themselves are intelligibly meaningful only in as much as they participate in basic existential current concerns. We care about them. Here's a self-indulgent example. I spend a great deal of my time working within the linguistic practice of being a, a, a professor of philosophy. The practicalities of that way of, of being sort my utterances non-arbitrarily so that I can exchange meanings with other people involved in those practices, mostly students and other professors of philosophy, or at least that is my hope. The game of being a philosophy professor fails to deliver any real meaning unless it is itself non-arbitrarily selected among other linguistic practices. What makes that determination? Why am I making philosophy professor type utterances rather than talking about chameleons or jujitsu or whatever else might be a worthy topic of conversation? It is my care for or commitment to something, say a, uh, say a concern for a certain kind of truth or wonder about certain enduring questions. It is because I share such concerns with those to whom I speak that I can use the linguistic practice of being a professor of philosophy to say anything at all. 
That is just my case. But we could say the same things about being a chemist, being a welder, being a mother, being a Catholic, being a socialist, whatever. These practices allow us to say something meaningful, intelligible about the world because they are connected to something we actually care about. If care is what sets us towards a practice, then it seems that we should care about that practice. For example, if your concern for human suffering commits you to the practice of medicine, then the practice of medicine should itself be a concern of yours. Uh, you should care about the practice of medicine because that is what, make, what takes care of the humans you care about. Likewise, if my, care for, my concern for wonder is what grounds me in the practice of being a professor of philosophy, then I should likewise care about the practice of being a professor of philosophy itself, as that practice is how I care for all those wonders. What does it mean to care about a practice? How does one show concern, not just for beings, but for ways of articulating being? It certainly is not the thin, facile care I have for those people I send Christmas cards to every year, even though I have not really known them for two decades, or the faux concern I feign on Facebook friend, for fa Facebook friends. That's not the real McCoy, as it were. That is inauthentic. What is real authentic care? Notice the subtlety in the word care. Uh, as it is linked with various prepositions. One cares about the Green Bay Packers score or cares about the price of lumber, uh, but a garden can be something I care for, or I can care for my children or care for my mother. Likewise, my, my pet chameleon is in my care or a therapist's clients are in her care. What does it mean to care for something or to have something be in our care? It is, as we put it in a quite familiar turn of phrase, to take care of something to cultivate it, nurture it, to see to its flourishing. In short, caring for something is taking responsibility for it. Sending barely initial Christmas cards to your all but forgotten college roommates, liking someone's uh, profile on Facebook, and keeping someone's crushing tragedy in the proverbial thoughts and prayers are not authentic forms of care. All that is just going through the motions. It's just saying something. It's play-acting care, behaving as if care, the simulation of concern without semantic value, mindless going through the motions. Raising, uh, rather, raising a child, cultivating a garden, taking your aged parent into your home, becoming a therapist, joining the Marine Corps, are all taking responsibility for something one cherishes, not merely making the outward but probably empty gesture of care. Authentic care is taking responsibility for something or someone and even, or, and even maybe taking responsibility for a way of being. What does it mean to authentically care for a practice? How does a doctor take responsibility for the practice of medicine? First and most commonly, the doctor cares for medicine by trying as hard as possible to be a good doctor. She takes responsibility for her adherence to the norms and practices of being a doctor. Uh, if care for human suffering is what sets someone to the practice of medicine, then she should care about being good at the practice of medicine as, as a means of alleviating human suffering. Likewise, if reverence for wonder is what sets me to be a professor of philosophy, then it seems I should care about the practice of being a professor of philosophy to work at being good at cultivating wonder in myself, uh, my students and my colleagues. Someone carelessly going through the motions of a linguistic practice is not caring one whit about the practice itself and whether he or she is in fact doing it right. Uh, that's not really to say anything with the practice. It's just to pretend. He is just babbling or play acting, even if his utterances have out, uh, out, outward form of intelligible speech. Just like my mass produced Christmas cards or offers of thoughts and prayers on Facebook. If I'm going to say anything semantically significant through a linguistic practice, I must be taking responsibility for getting it right. Real freedom and rationality require us to hold ourselves to standards of our form of life as they come down to us in our embodiment. Notice that there's a higher level of, of, of responsibility that one can take for a practice, a more profound sort of care. It is possible, is it possible the practice of medicine, as has been handed down to our contemporary doctor, turns out to be deeply flawed? Uh, could the medical practice, as she finds herself thrown into it, actually lead to consequences contrary to her concern for human suffering? Could she be doing more harm than good with regard to what she most cares about just by being a doctor? Might she have dedicated her life to cultivating a practice that simply gets the world wrong? Yes. In fact, this sort of revelation has come to us before. Think of leeching, bleeding cutting holes in the head to relieve bad, bad vapors and all that. Uh, should the doc doctor ask these questions? Well, probably uh, not on her way to the OR, OR, pardon me, the OR to perform an emergency appendectomy. 
Nevertheless, she should ask these questions at some point, right? I think she must uh, if she really does care about medicine, which is to say, if she is truthfully uh, to be a doctor. She must not only be responsible uh, to the practice of medicine as she has found it, but she likewise must hold that practice to a responsibility to the world. We need to hold our forms of life to a sort of semantic responsibility, to the way reality pushes back. We might say that real commitment and distinctively human thought itself require that we take responsibility for our embodiment. These considerations also raise a third type of distinctively human responsibility, authenticity. Uh, If I really care about a practice because it cultivates something else that concerns me, then I should not tolerate a situation in which that practice is really not worth caring about because it does not actually serve the good for which I care. Otherwise, I'm just steeping myself in no sort of illusion and going through the motions. Not raising the issue of the semantic responsibility is to leave open the question of, of what really motivates you to engage in a certain linguistic practice. If I do not really worry about whether the claims of my practice are true or ultimately useful, then it seems my real motives for engaging this way of being are at best opaque. Studied indifference to the possibility of failure of our definitive practices is not to care about them at all. This sort of self-delusion is likely only to bring ruin onto what we really claim to love. Taking responsibility for a practice is not just good at just to be good at it, but also being concerned with whether the practice is itself really any good. If we, if we dodge worry about the latter, then we are not persisting in our form of life because it is actually good, uh, but for some other unstated motive. Does the practice of medicine actually serve what our doctor most cares about? Does it disclose the world in a way that addresses those concerns? Does the practice of being a professor of philosophy, as I have been thrown into it, actually cultivate the wonder I cherish? Uh, I could be very good at being a professor of philosophy, even if that practice does not indeed do any good for the things I most care about. If I don't ever address that latter possibility, then maybe I am really only doing this because of the long holidays and the security of tenure. A failure to ask these sorts of questions about the linguistic practices that make our speech rationally intelligible is a way of doing uh, of dodging responsibility for them and therefore an expression of indifference not care when mick jagger said i know it's only rock and roll but i like it i think he probably should have added and i don't really care about it either moreover if the argument i am pressing is correct we should also point out that to mick that his rock and roll subsequently fails to say anything intelligible at all if he really doesn't care Somehow, however, I think the Stones probably did care a bit more than these particular lyrics express. Authentic care is being responsible for our practices to the world we care about, and that possibility is what distinguishes distinctively human semantic values. Distinctively human thinking entails responsibility, and responsibility entails care. Indifference erodes the fundamental conditions for mindedness. Whatever we make of the intelligible content of Mick Jagger's lyrics, we we have arrived at the following important point. The possibility of making sense presupposes our embracing of the possibility that our very means of making sense might ultimately be senseless. To get meaning off the ground, we must live in a human world, but that world must also be a real world. Being real uh, about things or keeping it real, as we say now, requires us to accept the possibility that much of what we cherish could run afoul of reality. uh, Humans mean things in the most meaningful way only because we can put the linguistic practices by which we define ourselves and address our ultimate concerns under critical scrutiny. Willingness to suffer the scrutiny is authentic care, and the possibility of such concern appears to be a condition for distinctively human rationality. We are beings whose being is always an issue for us. We ask ourselves questions about ourselves and quite dark dark questions at that. This does not mean that we must uh, be inherently skeptical. Our physician can resolutely go forward in her responsible practice of medicine even while being open to the possibility that someday the world may reveal that that very practice is bankrupt in regard to her most deep concerns. I can continue to practice as a professor of philosophy without shunning the possibility that the profession has outlived its cultural usefulness. Openness to the possibility of failure is not the same thing as admission of failure, any more than admitting the imminent possibility of death is giving up on life, though accepting these grim possibilities is necessary for our authentic participation in our lives. All that is necessary is a legitimate desire to know whether one's way of life really is a way of life uh, that is responsible to what is most worthy of our concern. Maybe in the end, your beloved practice gets it right. Who can tell unless we at least seek the answer? 
unless we put ourselves under the scrutiny of such questions, we shun the very possibility of thinking. Our course, of course, these, uh, there are dark possibilities that come along with authentic care. Our physician may put the practice of being a doctor at issue, subsequently to find that, is, that it is a failure. It does not get the world right as revealed by her concerns. I may have found that being a professor of philosophy is no longer a legitimate way to cultivate wonder. In these cases, being a doctor and being a professor of philosophy have become absurdities as we find them uh, in ourselves. What is one to do with such a state of affairs? Uh, that is, when one's way of being seems to have suffered a sort of death. It would seem one would need to utterly revise these practices, but that would certainly be easier said than done. Institutional reform is not is famously difficult. Does one just abandon the practice? Maybe, especially in the case of professions like medicine or academics. Notice, however, that abandonment does not displace the original deep concerns that bound us to these practices in the first place. I do not think one can give up on the alleviation of suffering or the cultivation of wonder the way one changes brands of shoes, or, uh, nor should one ever consider doing so. Certainly, giving up broader cultural or religious practices will be even more difficult to entertain than the loss of one's profession. One could just stick to it, keep on keeping on with the practice of medicine or being a professor. That, however, is to consciously accept a state of play acting. And it might even be to participate in doing harm to things and persons you care about. In any event, ignoring the revelations of authentic self-criticism is to subject oneself to whim, the whims of fate. Uh, no, there is no good course of action for someone who has asked the kind of question required for authentic care uh, and come to a grim answer. Thus, authentic care comes only with anxiety, but that is the price one must pay in order to say anything meaningful. Maybe we have arrived at a place for the virtues of hope and faith, uh, persisting in practices as they were meaningful, as if they were meaningful, simply because giving up on, on what you care about is not an option. Maybe remaining resolute will one day reveal something you have missed. Nevertheless, without putting ourselves at the risk, at risk out of love for what we care about and thereby accepting the requisite anxieties, we will go through our lives mere, merely babbling like robots. All right. Uh, well, I have gone a bit far afield, but not too far uh, as that last passing reference to robots suggests. If indeed a machine is to be produced that has the same sort of rationality as human beings, that is participating uh, in the human space of reasons, it will have to sort the world in terms of pragmatic relevance. But that likewise requires to do it the way we do it, right? That such a machine sorts linguistic practices by existential care. Furthermore, existential care entails at least the possibility that such a machine is capable of authentic responsibility for its own being. Can a computer put itself into question? Can it face the grave consequences of seeing its way of life as a failure? What would it be like for a computer to do any of that? I have no proof for the impossibility of a computer having an existential crisis, but I find the very suggestion almost laughably implausible. As Hoglund puts it, quote, cognitive science and artificial intelligence cannot succeed in their own essential aims unless, unless and until they can understand and implement genuine freedom and the capacity to love, end quote. Of course, that does not absolutely rule anything out. So I guess we have to live with that question as to whether uh, our way of being is, significant, is significantly distinct. But it is, that is a bit uncomfortable. It leaves us humans with our humanity in question. In the end, we might come to nothing special in comparison to machines. Is entertaining that possibility so bad? Can we own up to that? Might the fact that the question of humanity is always nagging us show us something about ourselves? How else uh, would you care for humanity but to take responsibility for the question of whether humanity is really worth caring for? Doesn't the anxiety spurred on by this question lead us a long way toward answering it. Doesn't this perplexity reveal you as something? Are these questions a machine could ask for itself or do these concerns only arise for spirit? Thank you. Well, I wanted to ask about uh, some, of the, some of the things you said at the beginning where you were saying that, uh, that, that one of the, one of the deficiencies with the possibility of in, uh, intelligence or rationality for machines is that they don't, they don't have any grounding for an understanding of reality within a community or they, they don't, uh, not being open to the possibility of failure or, uh, well, anyway, those, those, those are two of the things I had in mind, but I was worried that, uh, well, the, what occurred to me is that, could we, couldn't we say the exact same things about God and say that God can't be fully, uh, fully rational or intelligent because he's, uh, complete, completely self-sufficient on his own. So his intelligence 
has no grounding in a community or anything like that. And he doesn't need doesn't need to have any he doesn't need to have any care for anything that exists just because he's perfectly self sufficient. And he wouldn't be open to the possibility of failure or have any reason to doubt the doubt the validity of anything he thinks or does because he's perfect. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, two things. Um, you know, first, I, I didn't say that I was trying to say a machine could not be rational. I said that whatever you do with a machine, it won't be rational the way we are rational. Do, do, do you see my point? That uh, I'm not in this paper, I, okay, we could talk about other things, but I'm not taking a stance in this paper on whether or not indeed there could be machine intelligence. What I'm saying is whatever else machines might do, it's not any rationality they might have is not human rationality because it lacks that embedded embodied nature, right? Um, as to the theological point, I'll just go with Aristotle and say, uh, a man alone is a beast or a god, but it's not one of us, right? It's not a man, okay? It's not a human. And so um, I, I think you know, we, we would say that we resemble God in our rationality to the degree that we do realize this transcended possibility, okay? Uh, but for us, because we are not divine, that transcendent possibility only comes online and seems to be always tied to these embodied factors, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to say, yeah, we're not God, right? Would, would we then say that, um, that that machine's intelligence is just as categorical, or that, that machine's intelligence is just as categorically different from our intelligence as our intelligence is category, categorically different from God's intelligence? Um, I, I don't know. I would say that, um, it, it would, I mean, I think in as much as there's a possibility of our taking responsibility for ourselves, okay. That there's going to be a sense in which we're closer to God than we are to machines. Uh, if indeed I'm right. And it just does, I don't see a sense in which we can say legitimately that machines take responsibility for themselves. But then, hmm, are machines, are is machine intelligence closer to God's intelligence than our intelligence is? Uh, once again, no, because I don't, I don't think there's a sense in which machines, or it's unclear to me what it would even mean to say for a machine taking responsibility for itself, where I think I, I could make an analogy to God with that, right? And at the very least, at least in, you know, it'd be interesting if we, if we wanted to talk about just like, say, a pagan notion of God, like Aristotle's or a Christian notion of God, like Aquinas is like, like for Aquinas, in as much as God is a creator, you've got to say he cares about something, right? Uh, now we're going to, you have to like do some, you know, metaphysical stuff to make sense of what it means for God to care about something. But clearly if there's a creative act, then there is a concern about something, right? Uh, and, and, and that is the Christian notion, right? All right. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, yeah uh, thanks for coming to speak to us. Uh, wondering, just to make sure that I get it right. So it seems like inauthentic care would be to like not care about your practice and like not care whether you're doing it right or not. But then authentic care seems to simultaneously be like a belief that you are do like that your practice, say medicine, is actually accurately disclosing the world in the way that you want it to, but also that it's like an openness to being wrong. And so like there's like anxiety there but i'm wondering like is there anything that actually resolves that anxiety because it seems like when you bring up heidegger well heidegger says like it, i mean i don't know if i've ever really understood heidegger but it's like <laughs> oh like like we're anxious because we die and like we're like being towards death and like um because we can never actually know whether that's a really like um whether we're actually disposing the world through say the practice of medicine that's like problematic for us but like under um, like a religious framework and under the framework that like there is something after death, um, does that like change the way that we can view anxiety or is it still like fundamentally human? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, that's a really good question, right? Okay, uh, I, and you know, let's leave aside like what, like what Heidegger's actual view is because I think, I think his view is, a, is an unresolved moving target even for him, right? Um, but I think nothing I'm saying is excluding that we might be able to, you know, take up the self-critical project and come to an affirmative answer to it. Right. 
um, I think if, if we're talking about something like, um, you know, the, the practice of being a professor as it shows up in contemporary academia, right? I don't think one can ever be relieved of anxiety about that because like that kind of like cultural practice is always a moving target, right? And it, and it's, it seems to always have been the re- subject to revision and things like that. Okay. If we start going to bigger issues, right? Where there are possibilities of rational demonstration and that sort of thing, then I think then things could be different, right? Um, do you see my point, right? It'll, it'll depend. It'll depend what I'm kind of putting into the breach of anxiety, right? Is it literally just my profession? Well, I think that's something, you know, one might always live with a question about, you know, what good is this really done? Okay. Is it, you know, um, whether or not my theism is right? Well, there, you know, I think we're in, into a realm where there could be a kind of rational demonstration, right? And then, but I think until one takes up that project, you're going through the motions. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, come on down. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. For yeah, thank you. I'm interested in why we should use the Wittgensteinian uh, use framework for language and meaning. Um, and there are two reasons I'm skeptical about this. The first is okay. that it's not clear how, like, even under the Wittgensteinian frame of that, we just, the way we use words, somehow, like, we use slab and we point to slab and somehow become slab. It's still not entirely clear that we that we still have. It's, it still feels like there has to be external objects that that, that stand outside the language, which doesn't seem to be entirely consistent with Wittgenstein's general framework, at least later. Which as I understand him, that could be wrong. And so it seems like we need something like Lewis's reference mechanism. So I'm wondering why we why not something like that for meaningfulness? Why purely linguistic praxis? But the other thing I was thinking about it um, is the way in which Aquinas talks about propositions, right? And the uh, the way in which the form, the form of our thought conforms to the matter of the world and there's correspondence there. So I guess I'm just wondering generally, why is, are we embedding meaningfulness simply in our linguistic practice and not things that outside of ourselves, in particular, since this is a the conference, for instance, to our relationship with God? Why specifically the, 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 this, these sort of stipulated conventions? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this was, the, actually, you did miss this. Okay, so th- this, this was the Merrill Ponty part of the paper, right? That uh, Merleau-Ponty's you know point is that language use presupposes this prior, more primordial encounter with a real world, right? Um, now that that encounter will not necessarily be conceptually articulable. He sees it in terms of cultural inheritance and you know um, you know like early childhood training, um, you know, emotional attachment is where a lot of this is played out in later literature. And so I agree with you um, with with something like uh, Wittgenstein in some of his moments, I think he has other more realist moments, but in in some of his moments, you're left with an almost, almost, be careful with this, an almost kind of linguistic idealism. Okay. And I I agree with you that um, I think for something like that to be useful, you do need this prior phenomenological appeal. And I find that in people like Merleau-Ponty pretty effectively done, right? Um, Okay, now about uh, the relationship with God. um, I don't, I mean, I I don't arrive in the world with a self-conscious articulable relationship to God, right? I mean, that's pretty far up the ladder of cognition, okay? Uh, I think it's implicit, right? It's implicit in the world that I, I show up and I get thrown into, okay? But I don't begin there, right? I don't begin, you know, learning how to make my way through the world, you know, through, uh, through you know, through a direct encounter with God, right? Uh, I learn to make my way through the world through, you know, the, a caring relationship with my parents and siblings, right? And 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 training of that sort. Okay, do, do you see that, right? And my point is you're not making that trip, the human is not making that trip up that ladder to have a relationship to God at an explicit level, at an explicit level, without going up the ladder uh, that's entailed by our particular kind of embodiment. And and as much as a machine doesn't go up the ladder like that, it's not doing the same thing we're doing. Right, but just for for a very quick question, which is that a lot of the philosophers nowadays, for example, try to attach our entire concept of meaning to us, our entire concept of the world, ground it purely in human experience or even more specific naturalism and physicalism and rejecting God, that seems to be like a lesson from a Catholic perspective about the meaningful, actually less meaningful way of the world. There's a meaning to plot the entire way. So this I'm just wondering, like, it feels like it's more meaningful as a Catholic perspective, the more we talk to encounter the divine. And so it might be, there might be like something, I guess I'm just wondering how we should reconcile 
I'm sorry, can you do it again? I just didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, so so when I'm thinking though of meaningfulness, of realistic meaningfulness, um completely deprived of God, I'm thinking like of like the current way in which philosophy now like towards tends towards like physicalism or naturalism, materialism in such a way that it seems to be actually a lot of the way we think about it seems to be less meaningful for us to defend human beings. And so I'm just I'm wondering, like there's it seems like yes, the introduction to meaningfulness does have to be dealing with like social, socially grounded. But it seems like there's a greater meaningfulness that, that emerges from our own. I guess I'm just wondering how we make sense of that if we're not, if there isn't like an end, I mean, an end to our meaningfulness of heroes or something. Yeah, I don't see, I'm not denying anything like that. Right? I mean, I think there's a top of the ladder to get to. Yeah. I mean, think of it like even, even in Plato's Republic, right? Um, you know, the education of the guardians, um, yeah, you know, like he wants them to learn trades, right? Okay. I mean, he's, they're going to learn trades and they're going to have basic education and they're going to do like military service. And then they're going to do all these uh, tactile things, right? That are part of human development. Okay. Uh, all with a mind to like eventually transcend all that. But, you know, my point is without going through the real human steps, right? Uh, even if something can just skip to, you know, disembodied rationality without going, I'm not saying machines can do that, but even if you could show a machine that skipped to disembodied rationality, I would not then say what it's doing is equivalent to what we're doing because what we're doing is, is, is linked to that, that process of getting to transcendence. Like, you know, this is what's distinct about human beings is we don't get to skip the transcendence. We have to get to it through this sort of tutelage and embodiment. 